Welcome everyone. Uh, we're just gonna have this opening slide up for a minute while we wait for everyone to connect. Uh, we'll begin in about one minute or two while we just wait for others to join. So please be patient, thank you. All right, it's about a minute after, so I think we have a, a good group on and some others might be joining, but thank you for uh, taking the time out to talk to us about artificial intelligence, the technology for the new next. Uh, my name is Jessica Lee. I co-chair the Privacy, Security, and Data Innovations Practice Group at Loeb & Loeb, and I'm excited to be here with Ken Adler, who chairs our technology and sourcing department. So we're looking forward to this uh, first in our connectivity webinar series. Uh, where we'll be focusing on AI. Just gonna go through some housekeeping items before we jump into the content. Um, so we're using the Zoom webinar platform. So unlike in a Zoom meeting, attendees will not be able to unmute or turn on a video, but we do encourage you to type in any questions you have at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. The presentation will run about one hour and we're gonna leave some time at the end for questions. So with that, let me turn it over to Ken to get us started. Thank you, Jessica. So um, let's talk a little bit about today's topics, uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, AI is, is obviously an important topic. Uh, I think during the pandemic, um, we found that AI has spurred innovation and transformation. So we want to talk about uh, AI, where we are, where we're headed, uh, AI technology explained, because as lawyers, we have to become technologists and understand the technology um, intellectual property ownership. These are difficult issues uh, dealing with um, AI created inventions and how that's dealt with under existing law. Data ownership and use and knowing what data is involved. Uh, key principles in AI governance, which Jessica will give a great detail, detailing the uh, current issues, which are hard to grapple with, of what to do with, with AI uh, in terms of its output. Uh, then turning to contracting, how, how do you deal with some of these harder issues in contracts and finally best practices uh, for now and what's to come? So where are we? Um, well, um, there's been significant adoption of, of AI. Um, thanks to our friends at HFS Research, they've provided results of um, some of their surveys that were done in 2020. And you can see that uh, there's significant adoption of AI already. Um, whether it's already in place, whether it's currently implementing uh, or in the planning stages uh, across the board, all verticals, companies are, are starting to implement AI beyond just dipping toes. Um, as expected, you see retail, consumer product companies, um, banking, financial services, uh, manufacturing technology is key, key industries that are adopting, but it happens across all industries. And we're seeing that with our clients as well. The pandemic accelerated digital initiatives. Um, I think that as uh, we entered the pandemic, a lot of discussion was had and, and a lot of attention was given to maintaining business uh, and how could AI help in maintaining business initiatives. Um, but as, as we got further along, there's the, the need for companies to think about how do they accelerate their digital initiatives because of the need for change? How do they drive greater profits and reach further uh, for the stakeholders? And, and how do they achieve cost reductions, particularly in a recessionary economy, which obviously the economy is fluctuating up and down and who knows what the next wave will be. But I, I, you know, it's very clear that organizations are looking very deeply at these issues and are looking at AI as a means to achieve some benefits. And AI is not just a nice to have at this point, uh, looking at other types of, of emerging technologies, uh, whereas in pre-COVID, um, you know, looking at our AI may have been a cost reduction 
initiative, now it's deemed to be essential for future survival. That's a pretty significant statement for enterprises to make. So again, um, this isn't just on the drawing board. Companies are deep into the decision-making process of implementing AI. Um, what is it that leaders, leadership is thinking about in terms of AI? Why are they implementing it? Well, it's not, to, you know, in, in terms of what to do in the pandemic, they weren't thinking about increasing workforce um, or, or outsourcing more operations necessarily, but using automation as a catalyst to modernize their legacy business practices, how to leverage it and modernize, but also the business continuity measures. Uh, I think a lot of companies found that their existing business continuity practices were lacking. Uh, and there's a realization this may not be the, the last time there's a major event where business continuity planning will come into place. And finally, looking to enable a purely digital workforce uh, as that emerges as, as an operating model. And you can see that, that companies are pursuing aggressively these initiatives. Okay, so AI, we've, we've all seen AI in one way, shape or form in the movies. Um, and we all have our favorite out of these. Uh, it glorifies technology advancement, um, but of course shows some downside to the AI technology um, as they're implemented. Um, you're probably familiar with most of these. If you're a sci-fi fan, you may know Colossus, the one on the lower left. That's one of my favorites. It's a B movie, but as a, if you haven't seen it, I suggest you do. Um, there's a lot of relevance today. Um, it's also called the Forbin Project. Um, but the takeaway is AI technology is developing today is happening and we have an opportunity to uh, help shape its development as, as well as its deployment and that's part of what we want to talk about today is what role as lawyers we can play in looking at the advancement of ai and addressing the risk profiles uh, as it gets implemented more widely if you pick up the newspaper look online anywhere you look ai is um, at the forefront uh, across all verticals, it's um, being implemented in, in our everyday lives. So it's not, again, not a question of will it be or, or when, it's how and, and how does it affect us and our clients. And, and it's important to really understand what type of AI is being implemented. Uh, and we're going to go through that in a minute to talk about the different types of AI. So you'll be familiar with that. And of course, AI has made a big impact in dealing with the pandemic, um, whether it's in uh, development of vaccines or uh, testing and otherwise in, in using it as tools to, do, to in, use in medical treatment. I think my favorite here is the MIT news. Artificial intelligence models detects asymptomatic COVID-19 infections through cell phone recorded coughs. That's pretty amazing. Um, and uh, if you think about how that gets implemented across the medical industry, um, the, the, these developments will really help in public health issues such as pandemics. Okay, let's spend a few minutes talking about what AI is. As I said, we need to be technologists. I, I have a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science, but you don't. Um, you do need to understand, though, the differences uh, because as with any emerging technology, a lot of suppliers will market things and say it's AI. Some things aren't, some things aren't. In any event, AI um, it really in its essence is trying to implement technology that will, um, it's something that's associated, things that we normally associate with human intelligence. It's really driven by smart software that can process unstructured data and automate subjective tasks through patterns really trying to mimic human thinking. That's in a broad sense what AI is. Um, but there's different types of AI. There's machine learning. And machine learning is building algorithms for the computer to perform tasks through analysis, understanding, and identification of patterns. So the data is fed through the system, through the algorithms. Uh, patterns are created, and that leads to um, uh, lots of output and results that can be used uh, to, to achieve a certain result. Um, and that's why the algorithms are, are so important in understanding how AI works. You'll also hear about deep learning. 
deep learning structures algorithms in layers. And that creates an artificial neural network that can learn and make intelligent decisions on its own. Um, we're going to talk in a minute and show you some graphics of how these things work. There's another type of AI. Sometimes it's called process automation. Sometimes it's within AI. It's called robotic process automation. This is a little bit different. This is where software is created through, through RPA tools. And sometimes they're called bots. And they're, you're really creating smart software that is programmed to perform repetitive tasks. Um, usually it's raw tasks that are done by low level employees that are very repetitive. And if you could really program every step and every decision making process that's done within a particular work stream, that can be automated uh, and free up um, team members to do other more important tasks rather than doing the raw tasks. But again, that's part of the package of AI, and that's why it's important to understand the distinctions between these types of technologies. Let's talk about artificial neural networks. Um, these are uh, computer systems that are loosely modeled after the structure of neurons in the human brain. And essentially, you're putting together layers of nodes um, that talk to each other. They activate one another through weighted connections. Um, so it's not that it's um, a linear path of programming that you may see normally, but now a decision-making process has to be made that mimics what we do as humans. So there's the statistical techniques to alter weights as more data goes through and there's training of systems as more data goes through. You'll hear a lot of discussion around how uh, AI gets smarter uh, as there's more data put through. Sometimes you hear the term data lake. Um, so more data going through allows uh, better determination of the algorithms and ultimately creation of weightings to get better results, more efficient results. Um, so that's, that's what the patterns that come out of this are important. And that's where you get the most value out of AI. But there's a downside to that. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So what are we talking about here? You know, we have um, from a human perspective, we have cells that look to talk to each other. Um, they, they send signals to one another through synapses they jump the synapse and send information across more in a linear fashion. It gets a little more complicated when you have multiple inputs and outputs, but how do you make that work in an artificial environment? Well, it's a little different. Um, you need to think about how to program in layers so that there's all of these different inputs that then talk to other nodes and ultimately have weightings between each of them. So in every decision-making process goes through and sorting through, and it's the algorithms and the weightings that will uh, determine the accuracy of the AI being created. So there's a lot of focus on the weightings and the algorithms and, and how these work. And Jessica's gonna discuss them a little bit, the, um, the formulas, the layers, and the weightings because they can cause bias if they're not um, properly implemented. Um, and that's where there's a lot of discussion today. So let's talk about some existing uses of AI. These are things that exist today. Um, autonomous vehicles. Um, they're here. Uh, just a question of when will it be you know, generally implemented uh, across our, our roads, uh, but they are coming. Um, and, and the AI is used not only to operate the vehicle as you'd expect as a technology, but if you read the articles about AI, there's a lot of discussion around how do you program autonomous vehicles to deal with non-autonomous vehicles? That's really the gap where you have people driving cars and they make moves out of nowhere, uh, unanticipated. So you've got to create smart software that anticipates what humans will do when they're driving until everything's automated. Facial and speech recognition, um, again, implemented today, used for multiple purposes from security to military and other corporate uses um, and, and just getting smarter in terms of uh, speech recognition and facial recognition. Price optimization, um, you know, smart models in determining how things should be sold in the marketplace, uh, how things should be procured in the marketplace in terms of where, what pricing should be in place both from a retrospective uh, perspective, understanding 
uh, existing supply chains, understanding demand, all of that going into making the optimization for suppliers and customers. In securities, trade execution, um, you know, that's happening every day today where AI is making a better determination of where trades are executed and how they're executed. And that's just some examples of, of what we're seeing here. There's obviously a lot more. And let's focus a little bit on, on some specific industries. So in automotive, um, you know, that's an area where we're seeing a lot of AI and sort of supply chain. So predicting and adjusting production uh, to respond to changes in supply and demand. So as supply uh, has changed, even in the pandemic, there's been significant changes in supply and the demand has changed dramatically. Supply has gone down, but demand has recently risen significantly. Um, you may have read about chip shortages. So all of that goes into how do you manage your supply chain? Having AI do that really increases the efficiencies in procurement. In production, in actually producing vehicles, you can increase efficiency uh, in reducing the risks of errors and reducing manual labor and potential injuries. Um, so automotive is a really very significant area where um, we're seeing AI implemented. The insurance industry, think about how this, you know, you can reduce the need for manual rate calculations. Um, you know, if, if insurance in, uh, companies can get smarter in terms of actuarial for life or um, risk and, and uh, claims across other types of insurance, uh, it certainly can uh, help in, in determining premiums and how they go to market and simplify payment processes and paperwork as well. Healthcare, um, again, something we think about in terms of how AI can be implemented. Um, yes, it can be implemented for helping healthcare organizations as businesses in their administration, in their back office, um, freeing up uh, resources to do other things and taking care of more menial tasks or an automated process, whether it's discharging and transfer or billing or claims and that back office type work. Um, but in patient care and diagnosis, there's a quite a bit of work with AI. Uh, if there's the ability to do telehealth, uh, which we've seen a lot in the pandemic, uh, using AI as a triage mechanism for consultations and, and medications, uh, protecting healthcare workers with contactless monitoring of vital signs so they don't have to put themselves in harm's way, and improving diagnoses for medical imaging, such as CT scans and x-rays. All of these are, as you can think about it, are taking existing data, massive amounts of existing data, running them through these algorithms, creating smart AI, and, and helping businesses to um, streamline and come up with better results. Let's turn to advertising. Let me turn it over to Jessica to, to think about how AI is being used in advertising. Thanks, Ken. And that was really fascinating. And I think the theme is we're seeing the acceleration of the pace of AI um, in the pandemic in particular, uh, requiring us to look more at this technology to advance business initiatives. And you know, one place from you know where I sit and I see this most often is in the future of advertising. So if, if anyone is listening who is in this industry, whether you're you know a publisher, an advertiser, an ad tech company, if you're in that kind of advertising or media ecosystem, you have to be aware that there is a contraction on the use um, of third-party data and the sharing of third-party data. You know, and that's coming from platforms, that's coming from regulators, that's coming from consumers. And so how we've traditionally done advertising over the past few years, um, using programmatic advertising and, and real-time bidding through third-party cookies, we're needing to look to other solutions. And there are a number of efforts to develop those solutions that are being powered by AI. Um, so for example, enhanced contextual targeting. You know, we used to describe uh, contextual targeting. I would give the example of if you, you know, if you're selling sneakers, you're selling running shoes, you can sell that on a, you know, running magazine or running site. Well, that is kind of rudimentary at this point. You know, with AI, you can enhance the sophistication of that technology. So rather than kind of saying, you know, sneakers go on a running site, you can put input um, a number of search terms that will help the AI determine 
what's the best context for a running sneaker that might go beyond something that's fairly obvious, like a running platform. So now we can get more sophisticated where we might find people that again, is based off of the context where one might be interested in running sneakers, but not um, specific um, and target it towards an individual person. So that's a privacy protective way to do enhanced contextual targeting, where you might be able to see, if not the same, you know, a similar lift that what we see with uh, some of the targeted advertising that I think is under attack right now. Um, you know, so I'm sure many, if you're again in this space have heard, you know, Google is looking to develop cohort based targeting as kind of its post cookie solution. And again, that is powered by AI, the cohorts are based off of an algorithmic process that happened in the browser that generate cohorts that target users based off of their browsing activity. But again, instead of targeting based off of a cookie ID that's uh, dropped on a specific browser and is targeted to that specific user's behavior over you know, multiple sites and platforms, you know, potentially tying that to their offline activity as well, it's based off of a cohort. So you might have people who are interested in running, for example, and that, you know, that flock, that cohort has an ID. And so one person might have many IDs based off of the cohort that they've been put in, but it's not um, based off of individualized level tracking and still involves some tracking and there are, you know, privacy concerns are being shaked out there, but that's again, a place we're seeing companies turn to AI to think about, well, how, what's the future of advertising and can we get to a space that might be more privacy protective than where we are today? And you know, some of the other pieces here were, again, things that were in place before, but we're just seeing an acceleration. So advanced analytics, um, getting more data about the performance, like what leads someone to convert on your ad? Where are they finding, uh, where are they seeing that ad? What causes or triggers the conversion? And so you can you know, optimize your advertising spend based off of those advanced analytics. So you can be more efficient with how you're using your marketing. And then we've seen exercises with automated creative as well. So you might do a, some form of A-B testing trying to figure out what creative is more enticing to the audience that you're trying to reach. And, you know, again, you, you know, you're never gonna say we're gonna displace our creatives, but you might get to support those creatives with the use of automation that give more sophisticated insights um, to what creative will be, again, um, most compelling to the audience that you're trying to reach. So when we're thinking about what advertising looks like, and you know, I think this industry in particular is in the middle of an inflection point, the future is definitely powered by AI. Jessica, before we go on, so I know a lot of people listening are, are saying, you know, how much of this is real today? How much of this is wish? Uh, or, or predictions of future? How much of this are we seeing now that our clients are, are actually dealing with? I would say all of it at this point. I mean, the cohort-based targeting, those tests are happening today, right? So those trials are happening now um, and we have basically have a two-year window uh, to, to sort out what this looks like. So in terms of the cohort-based targeting, that's happening today. I think we've seen you know, the analytics and performance optimization and even the creative sort of creep along, but definitely been accelerated over the past year. And then I think, again, enhanced contextual targeting, if we were having this conversation, maybe a year ago, it would be more in theory or kind of fits and spurs and trials here and there. But because of the pressure that's being placed on the industry now, we're seeing more companies first pop up in this space with technology, but then be more willing to at least bring it into the mix, right? So I can't say that I know a ton of companies that are going, relying solely on enhanced contextual targeting, but it's at least being added into the portfolio, portfolio so we can start to measure what the effectiveness looks like. Great. And okay, so this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Um, make sure to take down uh, the CLE code so you can get your CLE JA1921. I hope you'll, you'll keep paying attention, I'm sure after this, but I know this is what a lot of you are waiting for as well. So I'll turn it back to Ken to keep going. Thank you. Okay, turning to um, other, other important topics on AI, let's think about, um, IP protection, intellectual property. And let's, let's take a step back and think about what types of IP there are and how that applies to AI, particularly innovations that are created by AI. 
So um, patents, let's take that first. I'm not a patent lawyer, um, but I can tell you that patents, as I know, give inventors the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling their invention. So what happens when AI creates something that's patentable? Can the AI be the inventor? It's a tough question, which we'll jump into in a second. Other types of IP protection, copyrights. So copyright rights give authors uh, of a creative work the exclusive rights to copy, perform, display, distribute, create derivative works, et cetera. How, how does that apply when AI creates a work? Something to think about because it is quite different than human generated inventions. And similarly, the trade secrets. Um, but I think that one we can probably get through in our heads as to who's spending the money and who's keeping it secret in order to create the trade secrets. So let's jump a little bit and talk about VIP specifics and, and how it's going on today in terms of can AI generated inventions uh, be protected? So from a patent perspective, can AI be named as an inventor? Well, right now it's undecided. These, these are good uh, you know, law school questions. Um, there's um, a debate as to whether um, the inventions should list AI as an inventor. And it's not so much that the invention as to whether or not the invention is patentable. Um, you know, because the, the invention um, you know, may be novel and unique and otherwise uh, qualify for patentability. Um, but, you know, do the laws allow AI to be named as an inventor? And so there's been some um, smattering of um, new, uh, new patent applications uh, trying to push this issue. Uh, one of them is this device for autonomous bootstrapping of unified sentius. You may, you may read about the DAPIS. Um, and those were AI created inventions. One was for a food container, one was for a new beacon device for attracting and sustaining attention. Ultimately, um, the applications um, in the USPTO uh, were denied and in the European Patent Office were denied, both saying that AI cannot be under the law be deemed to be the inventor because the laws say it has to be an individual. So if it has to be an individual, who would that be if it's a patentable invention? Is it the computer scientist, uh, the individual who conceived and implemented the AI or the algorithm that was used in the AI? Is it the data scientist who went through and uh, pruned and reviewed all the data and determined how, how to train the model for AI? Is it the, the engineer who thought of the original AI itself? A combination of those, but remember, to be an inventor, someone needs to contribute to the conception or reduction to practice of the invention. And it's unclear whether those individuals did when it's AI generated. So that's a tough one. Um, and I think the laws may change over time. But right now, at least in the US, uh, AI created inventions are not patentable. What about copyrights? Well, copyrights, we have a mixed answer and it's pretty pretty country specific. Many countries won't grant copyright protection to non-human authors. Um, in the US, there's generally a US uh, a human-based requirement that, that a, uh, an author is, is human, um, both either by statute or by practice. Uh, and um, there's a different answer in UK and other countries. UK has laws that, that say um, that the producer of an AI generated work is the author. So that could be the individual who made arrangements for the creation of the work, um, et cetera. So, you know, in other countries, New Zealand and others have similar laws. So it's really split across jurisdictions. And it's something to think about in terms of how do you protect these inventions as there's more and more AI innovation. Let's turn a little bit to data. Um, here the question is, how do we know what uh, rights the parties have with regard to data? 
and particularly if you're a customer of um, usage of a supplier's AI engine. So how do you know what rights you have in the data, what rights you're giving others to use your data? I think that the starting point here is understanding what types of data are involved. You sort of have to split it apart. That could be the data that you input in terms of using uh, devices or using software. It could be device data that's collected from smart devices that are connected to the AI. It could be market data that's out in the industry. It could be social media as it's being scanned and scraped. Uh, observed media, if you're watching over how the AI operates or watching over a situation. And beyond all of that, there's this question about derived data, which is the, the data that's created through the use of the AI. For all of that, there's always a question about who owns the data, who has a continuing right to use the data, and for what purposes. And that's really the subject of a lot of negotiations um, where the owners of the AI want broad rights to use the data because that's what fuels the AI. It only gets smarter uh, where there's more data that runs through it. And yet a lot of companies, particularly in regulated industries are concerned about how their data is being used and restrictions on that. So there's a little bit of a tug in terms of data. I know Jessica, are you seeing your clients think about these particular issues, particularly in regulated industries? Definitely. And I think, um, you know, the argument we see on the side of the vendor is typically we need the data to, to empower our product, right? To get the best use of our product, we're going to need to be able to get access to your data. Um, that just has to be the benefit of the bargain. And I'll, usually I've seen this get to the place where the deal will fall apart if you don't allow some access uses, because that's the, that's the oil that powers, that powers the technology that they're providing. And so I think it's something that uh, particularly for companies in regulated industries are trying to find ways to carve out some exceptions. So for example, I see this in the fraud and security space. I think some companies can get comfortable there. I think once you get outside of that to broader uses, you're going to have more um, uncomfortability with how much data is getting shared. But again, depending on the service that's being provided, I think you have to allow some amount of, of access to data because that's, it. that's the only way you're gonna power a service that's gonna be more helpful and useful to you. I, I think that's right. And as we get further into these transactions, there's a lot of discussion and diligence to be had to better understand how a supplier needs to use the data and um, you know, what rights are, um, you know, can be given un under regulation. So that's something to, to think about. And, and Ken, uh, we have one question in the Q&A. Um, what's the definition of observed data? And is derived data the same as output generated from the AI application? Uh, I think the answer to the second question is yes, but maybe a, a deeper dive into observed data. <laughs> well, yeah, the answer is yes and no. I think <laughs> derived, derived data can also be interim data that's created in the processing of data, as opposed to just the output of the data. Um, we saw a situation, not in AI, but in, a, in another situation of, of hosted and processed data where interim data was created uh, by a supplier on a hosted system that was necessary for certain processing to take place. And when the deal was over, um, the supplier was unwilling to give that derived data back to the customer, even though contractually there was a good argument. It was an early contract on it. It wasn't 100% clear. Um, but if there's a desire to, to need that interim data beyond just the output, I think that's what's important. The observed data, I don't think there's a formal definition. I think it's more about just as, um, take an example of um, perhaps it's AI that's based on video monitoring. That's observing a situation. Uh, it could be in supermarkets where, where uh, AI is, believe it or not, watching people who are taking things off shelves and putting them back. Um, just to know what consumer sentiment is. That's observed data, um, an example of observed data. So I, I think there's a lot of these different types of categories of data. The best way to think about all of this is to talk about it with the business team and really get a better understanding of what data they think is involved and what data they're willing to permit a supplier to use and what the company needs back in terms of its own use. Makes sense. With, um, all that, 
let me turn it over to Jessica to take us through the, the harder part of this. That was all the easy part. Uh, let's talk about the hard part, which is how do you deal with principles to govern AI um, when there's so many unknowns? Yeah, definitely. And I think we're seeing, um, you know, I, I see this across the across industries um, for companies that are looking to jump into the world of AI. Data is what powers it. You could not have successful use of AI without the data behind it. Um, and so if you're going to be ingesting that data or even if you're relying on companies who are doing that work for you, uh, you know, it makes sense to have some principles or some governance in place. And I think, you know, particularly when I talk to lawyers, there's a lot of concern about, well, we're getting all of this data, you know, we're not sure what the use cases are, how to, like, what rules do we put in place, particularly as, as Ken alluded to, there aren't, it's not like they're hard and fast rules in this space, right? We can't point to, there, there are some laws against, you know, discrimination, there are some privacy laws, there's some, you know, intellectual property laws, but there's nothing, there's no hard and fast rules. So a lot of this requires internal governance that's based off of what you're doing and your risk profile. Um, and, you know, so I think when we're thinking about putting together a governance program, these are some of the key principles. And, you know, these are also the principles we're seeing being keyed into at least proposed legislation that's looking to govern AI now. So we're talking about fairness, um, which you know we'll talk about in a minute in more detail, but really goes into how is the data being used and what the impact is on the individuals who are the subject of an AI-based decision. Uh, you have reliability, you know, how accurate, how much can you rely on, on this data? You know, I had a conversation with someone about chatbots and you know, laws that require companies to disclose when a chatbot speaking. And the question was, well, what difference does it make if it's a chatbot or not? Well, you put more, um, I think you put more weight in a decision of something that's powered by AI, or you can at least put it to context when you know you're talking to a human versus you know, something AI powered or a robot. And so you, know, you want that data to be reliable. Um, they're obviously, because we're talking about data, we have privacy and security concerns, you know, particularly when we get into sensitive categories of data in the healthcare space. Again, if you're ingesting all that information, you know, how are you protecting it from a privacy perspective, but also how are you protecting it from a security perspective, particularly in this environment of, you know, widespread ransomware attacks and, and, and hacking uh, that's gone on over the past year. You know, transparency and explainability is, I think, one of the key challenges. Um, there are a number of laws that are looking for companies to be more transparent and to be able to explain the AI decision-making process. And that is extremely challenging. If we flash back to that vision of the layers and the neural network, like breaking that down into plain English to describe to the average person about how um, an algorithm makes a decision is, is extremely challenging. And then accountability. So if something goes wrong, who can be held accountable? So I'm going to, if you go to the next slide, just go into detail into a couple of these things. And you know, as if you don't have a program now, as you're thinking about what should we be concerned about, what should we be measuring against, you know, I think these are some of the key principles. And so the first is fairness. And these are, you know, identifying the sources of algorithmic bias. This is one of the key concerns and complaints around the use of different types of AI is that there is potential for bias to be baked into that. Um, and the bias comes from a number of places, you know, so you don't just get data in a vacuum and it's automatically accurate, right? You get it from a number of different sources that can start it to go through. And when you think about that, you know, you have bias built into that. So you might have a data source that excludes certain categories of people. You know, so if you're making decisions on housing or mortgage, for example, if we look back historically, if certain groups were excluded from getting access to, to mortgages are not reflected in that. We've seen that in the automated vehicle space where testing was done um, on mostly white people. And so the car wasn't able to detect darker skin. So you see exclusion leading to um, potential bias that kind of gets into our training data. What are we looking at to train our algorithms? What information are we feeding into this? Um, and you know, this comes up in the predictive policing context as well, where you see certain patterns start to reinforce themselves. So the police go into certain neighbor, er, neighborhoods or areas, often they're low income, often they're very diverse. And that means that the you know, number of arrests that take place are higher there because the police are more concentrated. 
So when that data gets fed into an algorithm, it leads to you know, biased results. And this has been reported you know, in a number of different studies about how predictive policing can reinforce bias. And that's again, based off of the information that's being fed in. And so that's where program design comes in. You know, how do you, um, if we have to attest for the historical bias and then we are thinking about maybe limitations on our, the training data that we're using, how can you design your program to um, you know, account for that bias? And if you, and, or are you building your own human bias into that program design? You know, we see a lot of that as well, again, because these things aren't built in a vacuum. There are people behind all AI, not through the entire process, but it's certainly in sourcing of the data and building out the programs. Um, and then again, how is that outcome being interpreted? So if you're not aware of the potential for bias, the sources for bias kind of all along the chain, you know, how can you qualify that outcome and make sure you're not making um, a bias-based decision? And you know, in the EU, we talk about this in terms of automated decision making, um, and they've broken it down in terms of legal effects and significant effects. And I think this concept of bias is what I would put in the bucket of you know having a potential significant effect. And we've seen you know the FTC has said that that AI bias might be a basis for liability. We've seen a number of localities pull facial recognition, again, because of the potential for bias and misidentifying people on camera based off of their skin. So this is an area where you know, there is potential for liability and there's also um, a large potential for brand damage. So it's something you wanna correct for. Uh, the next big bucket here is transparency. So how do we make AI explainable? And again, if we're thinking about you know, whether it's legal effects or significant effects, I've been you know, denied credit, an insurance decision has been made, an employment decision has been made, even an advertising decision has been made. I need to understand why something has happened uh, you know, as the individual that's being the subject of this. So what factors have influenced the decision made by the algorithms and how can we make that more visible or transparent? You know, when we're talking about weighted nodes, well, what weights have been given to different factors you know, kind of in that, that layered approach? And you know, this is again, a place where we're seeing uh, a lot of attention and, and legislation being passed. So under the CPRA, uh, which will go into effect in 2023, the next version of the CCPA, the California Privacy Law, that will give consumers the right to access information about a company's automated decision-making and they'll have the right to opt out in certain cases. But you know, specifically, companies will be required to give quote meaningful information. So you know, some of the more generic ways we might see AI described, you know, I don't know that that's going to stand up to what that requirement is. So giving meaningful information about the logic involved in automated decision making, and then a description of the likely outcome and the likely outcome and impact on the on that individual. And you know, there are a few other laws that are looking to push similar transparency requirements. I'd also point you, and we'll um, send out some resources, but also NIST has put out you know, their principles of explainable AI, requiring there to be you know, a clear explanation, a meaningful explanation so that you can actually interpret it, uh, requires it to be accurate, um, and then knowledge-based. So there, there are a number of standards that are being developed to help companies meet this, again, um, stringent requirement of making AI explainable. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I uh, wanted to talk about accountability. So, you know, again, how do you hold humans accountable for these inequitable outcomes? And um, um, Senator Brown uh, pushed out this legislation, which again, has not been passed yet, but I think some of these are important at least to keep an eye on because it lets us know where regulators are going and what they're looking at. Uh, so the Data Accountability and Transparency Act would create an agency that would oversee the use of AI by companies. Um, and in particular, it would require companies to do things like engage in you know, risk assessments and disparate impact evaluations. So if you're a company that um, has any impact in the EU, um, from a privacy perspective, you might already be familiar with this concept of having to do risk assessments to evaluate you know, how your business activities are impacting an individual and how you might mitigate some of that risk. And we're starting to see this, con this concept of risk assessments come up in the US um, in certain privacy laws as well. This will be more specific to the impact of, of AI on the individual, but again, uh, similar, con um, similar concept. And it finally describes harm. I think in this space, you know, there's some clear harms, again, 
you're denied access to something, denied employment, housing, they're very clear harms, and then there's some softer harms. Um, and so I think this also exposes harm as an actual or potential adverse consequence that causes you know, a negative outcome. This will have a private right of action in addition to um, fines and investigations. So we'll see where this goes, but I think you know, I would look at this and think about things like you know, those risk assessments and those disparate impact evaluations in particular as a place that makes sense to try to incorporate into an AI governance program. We go to the next slide, we can look at the patchwork of laws. So I think one common theme here is that there's nothing specific yet, even though we're starting to see more regulatory focus. But when we're thinking about data, obviously there are a number of consumer rights. So if you're ingesting data for AI, how do you respond to consumer rights, particularly once data is baked into an algorithm, it gets hard to pull out, right? So how, do we, how are we gonna navigate this intersection between the practical implications of how AI works with um, the requirement to respond to these consumer rights? Um, you know, depending on what sector you're in, you'll have some of these sector specific limitations. And that's what Ken and I were talking about earlier. If you're in a heavily regulated industry and you have to get very explicit consent to give access to data, for example, if it's health data or financial data, how will you navigate that? You know, we'll, I'm sure we'll start to see this creeping into the children's data space as well. And that will require, you know, parental consent. What does that start to look like? And again, that goes back to how do you explain what you're doing? How do you explain the income, the impact so that you can get the accurate consent? Um, you know, some of the laws in terms of what's AI specific are again, still um, uh, not, not passed yet. They're still being considered, but we do have BIPA, the Biometric Information Protection Act in Illinois. There are a couple in some other states, but that's the one that has the big hammer of private right of action. Uh, there've been a number of facial recognition bans. So I think, Again, if we come back in a year, I imagine this list under the AI specific laws will likely have grown significantly both on the federal and state level. Um, and then again, you know, when we're thinking about bias and creating these programs and thinking about, you know, I think some of this is just trying to figure out what guardrails do we need to have in place so that we don't let this thing grow too far, too fast and get ahead of, get away from ourselves in a way that's gonna again, lead to either fines or brand damage. Thinking about some of the anti-discrimination laws. So if you're dealing with, you know, protected groups under the Civil Rights Act, if you're dealing with genetic data under GINA, there's Fair Housing Act, there's EEOC, there are a number of different anti-discrimination laws that will at least provide some framework for what guardrails in this space looks like. And, you know, the EU um, does tend to be ahead of us sometimes in terms of at least regulation in these areas. And so the EU has been very active in this space as well. Um, they put out guidance on what trustworthy AI looks like, this idea that it should be you know, lawful, ethical, and then robust from a technological and social perspective. That's more general. If you go to the next slide, I think you know, this um, EU guidance that was released in the past couple of weeks, this has been a long awaited proposal that really gives more teeth to what at least regulators in the EU, in the EU are looking for. Um, and so it has some strict prohibitions. So, you know, AI that deploys subliminal techniques, um, you know, that will cause someone either physical or psychological harm, um, completely prohibited. Um, AI that exploits the vulnerabilities of a group based on age or physical or mental disability, again, prohibit it. Um, the use of AI by public authorities for social scoring, I think that was a specifically a nod to uh, what's going on in China, where they do engage in social scoring. And you know the concept that that could creep outside of China into other places is um, probably terrifying for a lot of people. And so uh, you know they've explicitly um, banned that. And then the use of real-time fa uh, facial recognition in publicly accessible spaces. This is kind of in line with what we're seeing in the US as well um, in terms of those bans. But you know these use cases, I think for most on, on who are listening here, hopefully you wouldn't be kind of tipping into these spaces. It's really, um, I think, again, trying to create some guardrails and then regulating generally based on risk. So it does give some flexibility for companies for innovation because that's been the concern here. If regulation steps in too soon, then it will stifle innovation. We'll never be able to kind of get where we want to get with this technology. So it requires, you know, a risk management system. Again, thinking about what those impact assessments might look like. You know, having data governance requirements, um, record keeping requirements. You know, where did you get? Where, you know, what's the source of the data? You know, more information that will go into the explainability. 
what rights or restrictions are around that information, um, you know, post mo uh, market monitoring. So kind of once you let something out into the world, what is the what does the impact look like? You know, we saw this with a, a company that shall not be named put out um, a Twitter bot that was supposed to demonstrate the effectiveness of, of conversational AI. Um, so the idea was that as it tweeted and interacted with people on Twitter, you know, it would grow and its ability to have kind of natural language based um, conversations would be demonstrated. But for anyone who spends time on Twitter, um, it's not always a place where you get a lot of positive affirmations. And so after I think a short period, it started tweeting out a lot of racist, hateful things because that's what was being tweeted at it. And it eventually had to be shut down. So that's kind of like, you know, garbage in, garbage out concept. So you really have to look at well, how something's performing because if you see something going off the rails, you obviously want to push, uh, pull that back as quickly as possible. And that requires, you know, some incident reporting and then uh, registration. So, uh, you know, the US doesn't really go as far as the EU does um, in terms of a lot of regulation in this area and in the privacy space, but I do think that we can take some inspiration from what we're seeing there, again, as we're building up programs internally and also looking ahead to what might be proposed by US regulation. And then I'm not gonna read through this, but this is something I think you'll have access to the deck after that you can think about, you know, how do you check for harm? Uh, you know, I think particularly as lawyers, you know, trying to bridge the gap between you know, the data scientists and the engineers and tech and lawyers becomes a challenge and we need to find a way to speak each other's languages. And, you know, I think some of these questions can just help trigger the conversations that will get the legal teams either comfortable or uncomfortable to figure out kind of what advice and guidance they need to give, um, again, so that we can facilitate innovation but protect the company at the same time. So Ken, I'll turn it back to you for our best practices, I think. Thank you, Jessica. That's a lot of food for thought. Uh, and <laughs> over the next couple of years, there'll be a lot more uh, innovation in this area and changes in laws that we'll have to stay on top of. So being practical as lawyers, how do we address some of these issues as they come up in contracts? If we're helping either suppliers or, or customers uh, as, as they're adopting or selling or adopting uh, AI-based solutions. So we talked a little bit about IP. Obviously the who owns what is really important. And a lot of those rights can be apportioned by contract. Uh, I think that what's important here is understanding the components. If we're talking about software or custom software, methodologies, algorithms, data, trained models, out of all of that, you know, what is it that the customer really has an expectation to own, if any? Uh, and if it does, what rights does it want to allow a supplier to continue to have and use? whether it's for that product or, or anything else. So that's gonna be divvied up in a way that makes sense uh, and is probably uh, going to affect the economic model in terms of, of the transaction. For third-party rights, consider things like um, innovation here affecting ordinary contract provisions. A good example are bots. Are, are digital workers considered users? Um, digital workers that can do multiples of transactions much faster and greater throughput than individuals can. So a lot of contracts are based on humans or concurrent users and other types of, of metrics. So how do you deal with AI being introduced under legacy agreements that may not accommodate these types of issues? And finally, think about freedom to operate. How is it that both parties should have a right to continue to develop similar things? Um, Many companies have, you know, uh, arms doing different things at the same time. So uh, be careful about giving away too much or restricting and restrictive covenants in terms of um, what either party can do going forward. A tough issue, liability. Um, it's unsettled. We're not going to settle it in this discussion here. Things to think about, though, are how do you deal with errors in data? Who's responsible for those? How do you deal with biases in algorithms and who's responsible for those? Um, and in terms of liability, the liability cap formulations may not be appropriate for these types of inventions. Um, part of it's going to be the risk analysis and economic gain, uh, how these things are priced in the marketplace. Part of it has to be, what is the risk to the user, particularly in regulated industries? So there's a big risk reward formulation. I don't think this has emerged yet as a standard model 
I'm, we're not ready to give you what's standard going forward, but I think it's it's deal by deal, uh, very specific right now. Um, but that, as with other emerging technologies, will change over time as things become more um, standardized. So uh, in the last few minutes, we thought we'd come back and talk about um, four important things, four things that we as lawyers can do for AI that's being adopted now and what's to come and be practical and, and help in, in addressing these things. One is understand the technology. From everything we've talked about today, AI is lots of different things and uh, really need to understand the components of what makes up the AI. Is it machine learning? Is it deep learning? Is it RPA? Is it a combination of that with other technologies, which is very common with data warehousing and SaaS and cloud and other technologies? Uh, so how does it all fit together? One of the standard things we suggest is a good whiteboarding exercise uh, where someone um, will put up on screen and walk through for a layperson uh, how this all works and what the components are. Um, I can tell you from experience, as you go through that exercise, you will find that other people in the room didn't necessarily understand what it was all about. It's not just you, it's, it's the business folks as well. Um, you need to understand the data. You need to understand what data is uh, involved. Is it regulated, not regulated? Do you as a customer have a right to allow the third party to use the data the way they intend to use it in a data lake? Uh, not just benefiting your company, but benefiting others who are users of the AI as the AI evolves. Uh, do vendors have the rights to use that data they get from third parties for the purposes they have? So there's a lot of attention to the specifics on the data. Uh, as Jessica said, uh, when you get to these regulated industries, understanding specifics and being able to address the compliance concerns is really critical. Speaking of compliance, understand your compliance obligations. So, you know, for all the, the different current and anticipated regulations, it's a changing dynamic. And we have to be aware of how it's changing and advise our clients in a way that they can continue to be uh, in compliance. Part of this is also understanding how much risk can be placed on a supplier to ensure that their solution is compliant as well. So there's a bit of risk sharing here and needs to be an understanding. Uh, and finally, making sure you have the right people at the table. I don't know, Jessica, how have you seen this, but we see a lot of times we don't get the right people. To do this properly, you need some really important disciplines at the table. The SMEs, based upon that business line that's going to implement it and legal and probably IT, but others, right? I mean, HR, compliance, finance, risk management, lots and lots of different uh, folks need to be involved in order to do the proper diligence and create a contract that makes sense and has the right risk profiles and rewards for that transaction. Uh, so, you know, in telling your clients to involve IT security and legal early, well, that'll probably help and make this go faster, um, at least get a better contract done uh, as you're thinking about these. Jessica, thoughts about the team? Yeah, I was going to say, I think if you're putting together, if you're thinking about, you know, what governance looks like, what an AI governance looks like, and we've seen different models of this at different companies, sometimes it's framed in the context of an ethics group, sometimes it's just sort of, you know, a big, whatever, however you decide to formulate it, it's going to be a cross-functional group, and you have to have all of these teams talk to each other. I mean, I say this, you know, to, you know, clients in the privacy space as well anything that involves this level of data that has a business impact that involves you know the data scientists and engineers you need all of those different groups at the table and then i, I agree in terms of the subject matter experts depending on the use cases they need to be at the table as well to speak to what the impact is going to be and to describe you know in more detail kind of how they plan to execute so you know this isn't just sort of like you definitely don't want to jump in and legal and you definitely don't want to just leave it to the technologists you really have to have a conversation across the table yes. and one thing Ken, um i think we have a couple we only have a minute left there was a request if you could go back to my last slide with the check boxes um the questions and i'll pull up while you're doing that i'll pull up a question um one question that came in uh ken that might be for you in terms of copyright, 
you know, can the author be a company where the AI creation is considered a work for hire for the company? So in terms of, you know, if we don't have particular legal framework set up in place, are we able to contract around that using work for hire language? Uh, that's an interesting question. I don't think we have an answer for that today. Um, I, I think that's a good test case to see whether or not that would be enforceable. Um, I don't think we're there yet to make a determination. Are you seeing companies try to at least use some creative contract solutions, even though we understand that might not be enforceable? Companies are definitely uh, looking detail at who should own what uh, and making sure they own what they think they own in terms of development by contract. I think the harder issues are, the, are in terms of who, who's an inventor and how are the inventions actually protected if it's an AI created invention as, as to actual, actual IP right registrations. Got it. Okay. Well, we have one or two other questions. If we didn't get to your question, we'll respond to you by email, but I did want to thank everyone for joining us. We could talk for quite uh, some more time about this topic and I'm sure we'll have additional conversations on this front, but we appreciate everyone, everyone joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.